Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth installment of the 2017-2018 season of the Faith and Life Lecture Series. Thank you for coming in uh, today, actually not from a cold day, from a beautiful day. I'm glad you are with us tonight. Um, I'm Pastor Tim Westermeyer, Senior Pastor of St. Philip Deacon, and uh, we are privileged here to be able to host these events throughout the year. One of the questions I always like to ask at the start of our evening together is if anyone here has never been to a Faith in Life event before. Is anyone here new, brand new? Hold your hands up high. Good, excellent, special welcome to all of you. Very glad that you're here. Um, our pattern for 15 years now has been to invite thoughtful, intelligent, engaging speakers who are not theologians or pastors for the most part, but uh, had, do other things in other walks of life, talk about how Christianity and their Christian faith informs whatever it is uh, they do. We have had uh, teachers and writers and doctors, and uh, we had one politician once, um, not since then, actually. <laughs> He was super nice, actually. He was a good guy. Uh, we've had television personalities, bloggers, and on and on. Um, tonight, we are delighted to have someone who defines herself primarily as a writer um, and also does a lot of other things, including being a full-time mom right now. I will let her tell her own story, obviously. But one of the things I do try to do in these very brief introductions is say a word or two about our speakers that you may not read about in their official biography. Usually the way that happens is I pick them up, as I did with our speaker uh, at the airport and on the drive back to the hotel or to here, uh, I ask them, is there something that you could share that I could use in the introduction? Within about five minutes, um, Aaron actually, without my asking that question, gave me two items, which I'm now going to share with her permission. Um, one was, I asked her, sort of one of the first questions I asked was, uh, have you ever been to Minneapolis, or do you, do you come here often? And she said, no, nah, not really. And I said, well, you've probably seen it, though, because you know that the Super Bowl was here this past year. And she said, nope. <laughs> For me, that's a little bit of a metaphor of this art of slow living. Um, she then went on to say, there is one time that I was here, uh, presenting for a corporate um, a, a corporate gig, and she talked to the, f the the person in charge and said, "You know, do you have any tips on what I might want to share or how I might open the presentation?" He said, "Well, you can't go wrong by talking about the Vikings." And she said, "Well, I don't know anything about basketball." <laughs> uh, so, despite her lack of knowledge of football, she knows about a lot of other things. It's our pleasure to welcome Aaron Lochner. I'm sorry, Vikings fans. How many? How many Vikings fans? Oh, this is going to be tough. Um, well, you know, I want to start off by thanking Tim for inviting me here and just all of you for showing up tonight. Um, faith is something I don't get to talk about very often. And so, um, I mean, I've traveled around the world giving talks about art and design. If you ask me to give you 20 ways to transform a room on a budget, done. Absolutely. If you ask me what are some of the best practices on social media, yes, I can do that for you. But can I stand tonight and talk about my faith in this, in this beautiful church? And, and can I talk about how Christianity and my quest for for searching the heart of God. Um, can I can I talk about how I do that in an industry that sometimes feels faithless and consumerist driven and um, fast and vain at times? I don't. I don't know. I suppose we're going to find out. We're going to find out tonight uh, whether or not I can nail this. But um, I'm thrilled to do it because, I mean, Tim and I, when we talked yesterday in the car, he was sharing with me his vision for this series. Um, and I just find it so simple and meaningful, just a, a handful of everyday people talking about um, 
the intersection between the work they do and the life they lead. Um, the convergence between the things around us and the God above us. And I don't know about you guys, but I feel like whenever I'm asked about faith or Christianity or God, I kind of, I kind of freeze a little because I think, you know, who am, who am I to talk about that, right? I'm, leave it to the experts, leave it to the preachers and the, and the thought leaders, right? The people that are far more prolific than I am. But um, I watched Jeremy Cowart's talk online. Did, was anybody here for Jeremy Cowart's presentation here? It was beautiful. It was beautiful. It's online if, it, if anybody wants to watch it. But what I kept thinking about as I was hearing Jeremy tell his story was um, how our lives can be sermons and how our lives can be just the most powerful sermons of all. And um, it is just a true privilege to be able to um, attempt to share mine tonight. So um, I want to start off by saying that um, as a writer, a lot of my you know, writerly friends will swap advice every now and then. And the number one advice that I always hear about writing is, um, is to write what you know, right? That seems like a no-brainer. Um, but for me, it has always been write, uh, write what you want to learn, write what you don't know, write what you're, what you're wrestling with or you're doubting or you're unsure of. And so in a way, you know, the, mesh, the mission of this lecture series um, is my mission as well. I wake up at a really early hour. My alarm clock goes on off at 3 a.m., um, I do that because I have children that wake up before the light of day. Um, it's maddening. And uh, I start writing at 3 a.m. I pad out to the dining room and I pour myself some iced coffee. And I type words into the darkness. Um, and I write what I'm wrestling with and what I'm battling. And um, I believe it's a worthy fight. I believe that we owe ourselves that time of reflection. Um, whether we got to fight for it and carve it out or not. And so um, tonight I want to share with you just a little bit about um, what that story looks like for me. I want to tell it as truthfully and as faithfully as I possibly can, okay? Um, now I grew up in a non-denominational, somewhat evangelical, somewhat legalistic church and uh, does anybody, do you guys remember the uh, WWJD bracelets? Yeah, yeah okay. So um, I had seven, right? <laughs> so I had one for each day of the week. And on Sundays, I would wear all of them, right? So that like the other church people knew I was like a really good kid. And it's funny because when I think about that, when, when, I, when I reflect back on those years, I see now that this was a little bit of a habit for my, uh, for my generation. We were these, gosh, we were these pint-sized perfectionists, right, um, who believed the lie that more is better than enough. That if you have one, sure, right, that's great, but what about seven? Is it more better? Does it more make you better? Don't you want to attain perfection? And certainly, more is the way to get there, right? And so, it was, it was this message that shaped the bulk of my childhood and really of my early career. Um, it is the reason that I double majored and double minored in university, because two is better than one, right? It's the reason I moved to Los Angeles, became a stylist and writer, said yes to every opportunity, gathering money and accolade and fame along the way. It's the reason that my work popped up in top magazines across the globe as I amassed followers online. I went on to nab a two-year, 24-episode show on HGTV.com. I, I was called 
gosh, what was it, queen of Pinterest in multiple interviews, starred in a series of national IKEA commercials. And what I remember most about this time was that my calendar was just filled to the brim, right? Um, but there was always more to do. There was always more to achieve. And so I chased the American dream, the one that taught us to grit our teeth, to grin and bear it, to be faster, to be stronger, to push through, because I wanted to be perfect, because I had enough and I wanted more. And so, I mean, I want to I want to just jump in and say, hey, I am I am a Midwesterner, so that that good old fashioned work ethic, that I can get behind, right? I'm, I don't want to downplay um, the beautiful gift of um, falling into bed at the end of the night with you know sore muscles and depleted energy, and a day really well spent in good hard work. And I want to say this was not that. Um, this wasn't the chasing after hard work. This was the keeping up with what I thought should be done, keeping up with what I thought was expected of me. And um, somewhere along the way, I began, to, um, I began to question where my faith fit into all of this. Like, what was it all for? Uh, what was the purpose of fame? See, I have always believed and I have been taught in the God of the mustard seed, um, the God of small things, where our meager fish and loaves were transformed, not through, you know, a larger email list, not through more diplomas, but, but through his power, right? Like our, our faith, his power, not the other way around. And so... Here I am, right? I'm just I'm at the, the height of my career and I'm at the peak of this of this craziness. And slowly, ever graciously, God began to turn my face from the things of this world to the heavens above. And I think this is this is where I kind of want to over spiritualize things, but I gotta be honest with you. Um, I did not see I didn't receive an actual sign from God. What I received was an actual sign from the wall of Jimmy John's, right? <laughs> Number three, extra turkey. Um, and I, I totally wish I were kidding. This was an actual sign on Jimmy John's. Has anybody heard, heard the story of the Mexican fisherman? Yeah, a, a few of you. Okay, for those of you that have never heard this story, I'm gonna read it, it's very short. Um, it reads like this. An American businessman was standing at the pier of a small coastal Mexican village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several large yellowfin tuna. The American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish. How long did it take you to catch them? The American asked. Only a little while, the Mexican replied. Why don't you stay out longer and catch more fish? The American then asked. I have enough to support my family's immediate needs, the Mexican said. But, the American then asked, what do you do with the rest of your time? The Mexican fisherman said, I sleep late, I fish a little, I play with my children, I take a siesta with my wife Maria, stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and play guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life. The American scoffed. I am a Harvard MBA and I could help you. You should spend more time fishing and with the proceeds you could buy a bigger boat. And with the proceeds from the bigger boat you could buy several bigger boats. And eventually you would have a fleet of fishing boats. Instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you would sell directly to the consumers. Eventually opening your own can factory. You would control the product, processing, and distribution. You would need to leave this small coastal fishing village and move to Mexico City, then LA, and eventually NYC, where you will run your expanding enterprise. The Mexican fisherman asked, but how long will this all take? To which the American replied, 15 to 20 years. But what then? The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would announce an IPO and sell your company stock to the public and become very rich. You would make millions. Millions? Then what? The American said slowly. 
Then you would retire. Move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, take a siesta with your wife, stroll to the village in the evenings where you could sip wine and play your guitar with your amigos. And see, we have been taught that life is a staircase, right? That, that you climb further each year that passes and you move upwards in this, in this tidy trajectory until you reach the top and you're exhausted, and you're spent, and hopefully you have enough time left to reap the benefits and to enjoy the view. We've been taught that success will make us happy, and that happiness will complete us, that it will make us new, make us different, make us better. We've been taught to scale upward mobility in life and in business. But I just, I couldn't help thinking after reading that sign in the middle of a crazed week in a busy month after this fast and furious year, I just thought maybe there was a better way. And I wondered if in a world of businessmen, could I be the fisherman? Could I steward what I'd been given and call it enough? I couldn't shake the question. It would creep up every time I would set that 4.30 alarm clock to catch the flight. Um, It would creep in any time I was interviewed about another way to upgrade your kitchen. And at the time, I would get hundreds of emails from homeowners who watched my HGTV.com show. And they would email me asking all sorts of questions about room makeovers and upgrades and worldly solutions, and I found it so easy to give that temporary answer, right? That, um, the fast fix. I would get an email asking, um, do you have any recommendations on a dining room table that seats 12? And I knew in my heart of hearts that that person wasn't looking for a dining room table, they were looking for connection. Or, or the woman that wanted to know the best cutting boards to buy when she was looking for nourishment. Or, or the man looking for the best mattress on the market when he needed rest. And I just, I, I started to feel like the Harvard businessman. Although like way less Ivy League, okay, like, let's be honest. Uh, like I was encouraging endless bounce of consumerism, or worse vanity, in this attempt to scale up to get more and to improve on what didn't need improved upon. Like those stacked WWJD bracelets of my childhood where where seven was always better than one. And I wondered where it would end and when enough would be enough. So the doubts were clear and I began to consider the question from a faith perspective. I mean, when we think about the things that break the heart of God, right? Um, Starving children, widowed orphans, famine and injustice and mistreatment of his people. How could I consider those things in my mind while appearing in commercials, claiming a new bedroom set was an absolute must-have? And by the way, you guys, I still do not know the answer to that question. And here is where slow living comes in. Because the fast answer, the one that I'd been taught growing up, the one I'd built my entire career on, is to simply push through those questions, right? Ignore them if you must. Call it an off day. Get back to work. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps if you have to, but those doubts, they'll only hold you back. Don't give them a second thought. And I couldn't do that. The doubts meant too much, and the stakes were too high. So I considered the other fast solution, to quit. I knew fame and fortune weren't the answer. I knew peace wasn't to be found in prosperity. So to chase something else, to chase what I thought my faith required of me, I left it all behind, walking away. I wrapped the HGTV.com show. I turned down the network opportunities. I cleared my travel calendar for a season, deleted apps from my phone, turning off all notifications. I took long walks instead of back-to-back conference calls. 
In my formerly frenzied calendar that required three cups of coffee just to get through the day, it suddenly looked bare and empty and quiet. You guys want to know what happened next? Nothing. This is such an uplifting talk, isn't it? Right? <laughs> but the truth is, the truth is, I was still me after all, right? I was still the same flawed human being who wanted the fast fix and the quick band aid. There was some part of me, as I am sure there are some parts of you here tonight, that assume once you begin to slow down your life, you'll be content. That slowing down is the answer that we're all seeking. It's the missing puzzle piece. That God will pat us on the back with a well-done, good and faithful servant. You bucked the system. You're free and clear, right? And this is just, it's not, it's not always true. And I, I want to say this. Slowing down is not the answer. But slowing down is a path to finding the answer. It is not another arrival point. It cannot be the goal. You do not, I don't know, magically wake up in a Hawaiian beach on a private island with like no responsibilities and no problems and no commitments, like sipping your pour over coffee while the sun streams in in a room where there's no dust bunnies. <laughs> that isn't living slowly, that's living a fantasy. And maybe. I don't know, house theft warrant in the state of Hawaii. And Frederick Buchner once said, here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. And so I would love to tell you tonight that by adapting the slower life, your doubts will all be confirmed. Your questions will all be answered. And suddenly everything will be fine and nice and neat and tidy. But we all know that that's not true. What is true is that when you slow down long enough to steward one good question, you are granted a whole lot of other good questions. So here I was, um, a calendar cleared, a heartbeat slowed. I had space to consider the choices I was making whether or not they were nourishing, and not only to me, but, but to my community. Were they nourishing to the planet? I started cooking more at home. I avoided wasteful takeout containers, unknown ingredients. I donated two-thirds of my wardrobe and stuck to a daily uniform just to reduce the excess in my closet. I made choices for the first time in my life out of experience and not out of convenience. I tried to do the right thing and not the fast thing. I chose to pause and re-examine the habits that I'd acquired mindlessly while keeping up with our speed-focused culture. And I, this is where I want to pause to address the privilege of slowing down your life, or at least the privilege of choosing to slow down your life. Sometimes, we are intentional in slowing our lives. Yet other times, that decision is made for us. We might lose a job. We might become full-time caretakers for our aging parents. We might move to a smaller community, closer to family. We might birth a child with special needs. There are dozens of ways that life will slam on the brakes for your best laid plans. And if that, is, if that is you tonight, if you are left on the pavement with a broken spirit and no road map, might I suggest you hold on a little bit longer? Stand by. Because the most fantastic routes in my own life have been nothing but unwanted detours, sometimes years in the making. I want to tell you um, about my husband. His name is Ken. Um, he has a good voice, green eyes. He's funny and he's fun. He's a woodworker and a filmmaker. He's just, I don't know, he's the absolute backbone of our family. Um, by the way, he told me not to tell you guys I didn't know who the Minnesota Vikings were, so he's smart too. 
<laughs> um, together, we have two kids, one biological uh, daughter and a, an adopted son. And we'll be married 13 years this October. And what is fascinating about that is that when I met him in college, doctors had just told him he wouldn't be alive in 10 years. Ken has what you call a glioma on his, on his brain stem. It is an inoperable tumor. It is oversized. And when I talk about detours, this is what I'm talking about. Falling in love and marrying a man with a shortened life. And, and before I scare you all, um, this story has somewhat of a happy ending, or at least what you would call a happy middle, um, in that he is currently happy, and he's healthy, and he's thriving. He's every bit as aggravating and loving as you and I both can be. Also, here's a spoiler, he's 37, which is crazy, right? Like, he's nearly doubled his life expectancy. And I'm telling you all of this so you know that when I talk about life slamming on the brakes of your best laid plans, this is what I'm talking about. The truth is, Ken was forced to confront his own mortality from a very young age, in a time where you and I think that we are invincible. He was forced to think about what we're doing on earth and why we're doing it. And we both learned to trust that there is no easy answer or magic formula to getting it right. We have far less control than we think we do. And also, we have far more control than we think we do. And when you slow down long enough to ponder this, whether it's by choice or by circumstance, life begins to release its hold on you. When you truly come to terms with the fact that none of this is forever, that your day can change on a dime, that it's not about what you do or even who you are, but how you surrender it, that's when life in all of its complexities starts to become simple. That's when the question starts to look a little bit different. It's not, what is slow living? It's what is slow living for? And the answer is each other. Um, I don't know how much time Ken has on this beautiful planet. Um, none of us do. But his life reminds me almost every single day that, that our days aren't the projects that we think they are. It's not about getting stuff done or crossing things off our checklist. Our days are not something to be rushed through. Our days are a gift to steward. And once I began to understand this, this balance, this fine, intricate game of, of honoring life's weight while still holding it loosely, I started to practice it. And I started to realize that the how matters so much less than the what that there are a thousand different ways to love your neighbor, or your kids, or your spouse, or your job, and that the mechanics in the end don't matter as much as we think they do. That career I left behind, that, that wide open calendar, sometimes when you slow your life and you encounter blank space, you begin filling it with what you actually want rather than what is expected of you. There's this rule in, in decorating that to declutter any space, you take everything out of the room, like the, the furniture and the coffee table and the rug and all those dead plants, and you take them out of the room, and, and slowly, 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 you begin filling it with only the things you love, only the things you want to take care of, only the things worthwhile to you. That's what you add back in. So, like, gone are the tchotchkes and the hand-me-downs that you don't really know quite what to do with. Gone are the impulse purchases. What's left is a room that reflects you and your choices and your talents and your passions. And I figured, hey, if that works for decorating, maybe it works for life. 
I began to realize that I didn't have to walk away from a career that I loved, but I could find ways to shift my focus, my mission. I could utilize it for good. I could add back in only the things I loved, the things I wanted to take care of, the things I found worthwhile. I could do it slowly over time. I could consider it a lesson in relearning, taking the scenic route, if you will. And the first thing I added was a plane ticket to Ethiopia. I visited in the hot summer just before I was scheduled to film my final commercial under contract with HGTV.com. And I can't tell you enough how necessary that timing was for me. Um, I wrote a little bit of, about it in my book, and I want to just read you a short excerpt tonight. It takes only one visit to an under-resourced country to understand how far we've gone off course. It takes only one glimpse at the happy sparkle in the eye of an older woman, laughing as she dyes fabric with calloused hands, to know we do not understand joy. It takes only one visit to a room full of sex trafficking survivors, singing, dancing, swaying as they chop avocados for guacamole, to know we do not understand gratitude. It takes only one peek at a child's singular toy, a helicopter made from a trashed cell phone minutes card and a lollipop stick, to know we do not understand creativity. I am writing this from a coffee shop in San Diego where the general atmosphere is discontent. It is raining. A gaggle of women with the same handbag are exchanging woes like a game of poker. I'll take your remodeling and raise you parenting. I'll see your parenting and raise you aging. Fold. Businessmen in ties and shiny shoes two tables over are lamenting a deal that fell through. Life offers no deals, I think, recounting the past few deals that had fell through in my own life, recounting the past hundred deals that had never been offered to my Ethiopian friends. Mole hills into mountains, this is our offering. We are clothed, we are fed, we are sheltered, we are stressed. There is an Arabian anecdote that speaks of a man who loads his camel with a staggering amount of goods for the market. He piles, piles, and piles more until finally one single wisp of straw sends the camel crashing down. The camel has broken its back. I look around this urban coffee shop and see the camels, the heavy straw, the broken backs all around me. We are weary. We have burdened ourselves with an inordinate amount of possessions, with packed social calendars, busy work schedules, loads that are far too heavy for us to carry, and yet we grip them with clenched hands. More straw, we think. Just one more piece. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? This is from Matthew 6, 26. I have not yet told you why I am in San Diego. I am filming a commercial for an international home furnishings brand that is known worldwide for inexpensive white bookshelves and meatballs. <laughs> While my Ethiopian friends are weaving handmade scarves to send their children to school, I am encouraging those watching to upgrade their outdated kitchens with glass doors and under cabinet lighting. Come. Shop. Buy. Don't forget an ice cream cone on your way out. I am having a very difficult time with this. When we break for lunch, the crew is served food from the cafe. Pita sandwiches, poppy seed salad, baked chips, fresh cookies. I eat a small portion. And the overage of food is discarded into its shiny garbage bin in the corner. Collectively, we fill up the whole thing. The salad won't keep, I justify. Later in the day, I return to my lines. I stress the importance of a new mattress for your best night's sleep. And while my lips are talking sheet counts, my mind is remembering the girls who were stolen in the Ethiopian night. For them, there is no good night's sleep. There is no promise of tomorrow. I tout the benefits of art in the home, the benefits of pattern mixing, the benefits of color stories, the benefits of inspiration. 
A fresh coat of paint will revamp any space, I say in my smart blue dress. And I think of the peeling plaster in the huts of Addis Ababa nearly 10,000 miles away. I am having a very difficult time with this. As we wrap for the day, I survey the racks of closets, shoes, accessories we've stored in the dressing room for tomorrow. I think of the mattress, of the paint, of the under cabinet lighting. I think of the excess. On the cab ride home, I rest a pounding head onto cool glass. I peer out the window to watch the birds circling above as they flit around, energized by the setting sun. They have surrendered their loads. They are free in the sky, roaming untethered and cageless. They will not sow or reap. And I think then of myself. I think of the weight I carry to pad myself from need or discomfort or boredom. I think of the homes we build like bird cages with garage doors. And I think of how we roam this earthly, privileged soil, directionless in a sea of more. I think of all of us, weary in our suburban coffee shops, amassing everything my friends in Ethiopia need, but having nothing they want. They have joy, gratitude, love, community, grace, forgiveness. We have some of that, and we also have ECAT throw pillows, SUVs, and backyard fire pits. Ask an Ethiopian what they need, and they might tell you with a wide smile, amassing is meaningless. There is only today with holes in our pockets, with time spilling out. We cannot keep it for tomorrow. We cannot mend our seams to hoard or save or carry. Ask a bird how to fly, and they might tell you to remove the weight from your wings. And so, this is what I've been practicing, this removing the weight from my wings, operating from a place of enough, releasing that control grip that I've kept on my life, on my status, on my possessions. Instead of chasing after more, pausing to consider what it means to have less, and pausing to consider our skewed definition of less, and our worldly measurement for more, and here's what I want to tell you. If you are in that place of misalignment in your own life, whether career or otherwise, if there is something you are having a, a very difficult time with, it's going to be really easy to take the fast route out of there. It's easy to think the change needs to be grand and sweeping and all at once, but this is just another byproduct of our fast culture, right? I didn't need to make the vast change. I didn't need to walk away from my career to slow my life. But I did need to make tiny course corrections. And I did need to make space for what matters. I could still do what I loved, the styling, the design, the creativity, and I could have faith that those talents would be put to good use in a greater story. Quite honestly, in a story where the main character wasn't me. And so, for the past six years, I've shifted my career with um, a larger purpose at heart. I work a handful of hours in the early, early morning, writing countless articles exposing the truth about the way we consume in the U.S., about the ripple effect our habits have on the world at large. I write about our small, quiet life in Indiana, about all the momentary joys this life can offer warm bread, and baby toes, and freshly mowed grass. And when my kids wake up for the day, I chase them around the house, and I read Paddington Bear, and I slice apples, and make forts, and lose my temper, and ask forgiveness, and we all fall into bed exhausted and depleted, a day well spent. About once a year, I, and sometimes the whole family, visit under-resourced areas of the world, from India to Haiti to Ethiopia to Ecuador, to partner with local artisans in designing sustainable goods to sell here in the U.S., all proceeds returning to our partner communities. 
I've taught jewelry makers in Port-au-Prince how to use Pinterest to spot U.S. trends earlier so they can finally compete with a lucrative U.S. market. I've shot a lookbook at the Taj Mahal. I've taught a seamstress how to create a line sheet so she could begin to accept wholesale orders overseas. I've co-designed products with ethical fashion houses from Nashville to Nairobi to spread the word about sustainable business practices. My work is no longer fueled by wanting the most. And in this funny twist of events, my work is fueled by considering the least. I have never felt more at peace. And, and when I say that, I want to make something really clear. Uh, peace, like slow living, is not the absence of stress, right? It's not a life void of hardship. Um, it's not a day where you never freak out over small things. Um, let's be honest, if you're a parent, specifically of young children, you know there is nothing stress-free about the day that you find your daughter practicing mummy experiments with like three rolls of toilet paper while your toddler drinks water out of the dog dish, okay? <laughs> Slow living is not about reducing stress or clearing your calendar. It's about making space for you and for other people. It's about surrender. It's about stewardship. It's not about schedules. It is releasing your own small version of good and opening your hands and lives to trust in a greater vision. In other words, it's faith. It's not easy, but it can be simple. So, where do you start? The good news, I think, is that you don't have to spend money or time you don't have to like buy almond flour or change jobs or switch careers. You don't have to move homes or renovate your kitchen. You don't have to clean out your garage or diffuse lavender or take up yoga. You don't have to send your kids to Montessori and turn your spare closet into a meditation room. Good news coffee lovers, you don't even have to switch to tea. God of the mustard seed, remember? Small shifts. The first step to transforming your life is to notice your life, to pay attention. Look around, see it for what it is, for the immense gifts and the immense hardships. Resist the temptation to iron out the kinks. Try your hardest to laugh at your own inadequacies. There is tension and contradiction in everybody on this planet. A few years ago, I was interviewed by the New York Times for my approach to slow work. And if you want to talk about contradictions, right, they, they sent a staff photographer to my house. And in preparation, I ran out to our local coffee shop to get pastries and bagels and coffees and teas. And on the way home, I got pulled over for speeding, <laughs> right? The slow living girl pulled over for driving too fast. And that is just, right, that's the very stuff of life, the crazed contradictions. So I, I want to tell those of you here tonight that if life feels too full or too frenzied or too stressed or too much, then congratulations, you are alive. You already have everything you need to release what you don't. Ian Thomas once wrote this, and every day the world will drag you by the hand, yelling, this is important, and this is important, and this is important. You need to worry about this, and this, and this, and each day it is up to you to yank your hand back, put it on your heart, and say no. This is what's important. And if that doesn't sound familiar to you, might I read to you Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. That is slow living. 
It's making choices as if your own heart matters, and it is making choices as if other people's hearts matter. Living as if everything else is just fluff. So I would say tonight, wake up to the life you have. See it for what it is. Steward it for what it is. The budgets and the buses, the tumors and the tremors, we have it all in abundance. And although it is so tempting to do, we cannot fast forward through the hard parts. That's where the good stuff is. When my daughter was, was really, really young, I first began talking to her about the concept of living as if our hearts matter and living as if other people's hearts matter. And I remember sitting her down over breakfast eggs and, and talking about how God has granted us each with this unique inner life, with, with a heart that beats for certain injustices with a mind and a skill set that bends towards certain passions, with the full set of emotions and anxieties and joys that can often be unseen on the skin. And her eyes just light up as she catches on, and she says, oh, like an x-ray. And I think that's my wish for you tonight, that you consider your x-ray as often as you can, that you consider other x-rays as often as you can, and that your hearts beat well and good along the way. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Again, just a huge apologies to the Vikings fans. Go Vikings! <laughs> um, and I'll be sticking around for a Q&A in a couple minutes. Thank you. We'll come right back after, but thank you. Uh, thank you, Erin. I, I was going to tell her this um, <clears throat> later on the drive back to the hotel, but I'll say it publicly. Uh, this is our, what, 15th year of this, se of this series. Um, so, Erin, I think you are our 74th speaker. Is someone good at math here? Is that right? Is that right? Anyone? Five times 15? Is that right? Okay, good. <laughs> Um, that's not the point. Um, and so I've corresponded with a whole lot of people who have come to present here. 99% uh, of them have been beautiful, lovely, wonderful people. And by the way, if anyone is watching this on a YouTube channel or past speakers are listening, I love all of you. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you that the correspondence I've had with Aaron, um, I don't know what word to use other than the quality of the emails, there is a, a profound sense of, I don't know, presence, I guess I would say, so that's a compliment to you. Every time I've corresponded with her, I've felt like the responses have been thoughtful and beautiful and, and loving and caring. Um, and so I, 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 I'm just testifying here that something she is doing, in my opinion, uh, is allowing God to work through you and in you in very powerful ways, so thank you. Thus endeth the sermon, excuse me. <laughs> um, that's not why I'm up here at this point. We're, she's going to rest her, her uh, voice for a second. I just want to make a couple of announcements. After I get down, by the way, uh, we'll have a time for open mic Q&A. Uh, so if you have some questions that you have been thinking about asking Aaron, uh, there's a microphone right there to my right and to my left, and we invite you to come up, and we'll take questions for 20, 25 minutes, something like that. <clears throat> um, before then, uh, if I could just say a couple things. One, our next event, um, and this is listed in your program tonight, it's the last talk of this year's season, uh, features uh, Gary Haugen. Gary is the founder and executive director of International Justice Mission, which is the world's largest organization committed to, among other things, ending slavery. And if you think slavery was solved in the 19th century, the truth is uh, there are more people enslaved today than at any other time in the history of the world. Um, so it is a profound challenge for all of us throughout the world, and Gary and his organization are doing a lot of wonderful things to, uh, to rectify that. So I hope you'll join us for that. <clears throat> and I will say again, when we started the season, 
Uh, Gary's talk was going to be in April, and because of a conflict, he had to change it. So if you have on your calendars from an earlier co uh, correspondence from us the April date, please note the correct date, which is May uh, 3rd. Uh, <clears throat> that's one thing I want to say. Um, we are working on next year's uh, series as we speak. In fact, uh, this is not a joke. Just this evening at about 20 till 7, I got a commitment from one of our five speakers for next year. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who that is yet. You'll have to wait until we announce the series later. Uh, but we're hard at work on that. I think we've got four of our five speakers committed. Uh, as always, if you have suggestions for speakers, uh, you will notice this just fell off sort of providentially. Uh, you can tear off that third panel uh, and leave suggestions there. You can also, by the way, uh, leave us your email um, if you'd like us to correspond with you about upcoming events. You can also like us on Facebook where we try to keep things um, updated to promote uh, things that are going on with us. Uh, and then finally, some thank yous. Uh, as I say, every time I get up here, uh, these events from the start have been uh, made possible through wonderful, amazing, beautiful people who have supported uh, the series. It is not a budget item of the church. Uh, it's funded entirely through uh, corporate and individual contributions. Uh, I hope we have gotten all of the contributors listed uh, here. If we, if we missed you, please let me know and, and please accept my apologies. Uh, but let me say thank you to Productivity Inc., uh, Cressa, Honeybee Capital, Anselm House, Rapid Packaging, uh, Mally Design, Sparky Abrasives, uh, Thrivent Financial, uh, Motive Action, and Mastercraft Labels. Those are some of our corporate sponsors. Uh, and I'm not going to read every single name on here, but I know we have many sponsors and uh, supporters here tonight. Will you join me in thanking them? <clears throat> Um, I also want to thank Jeff Elstad. Jeff uh, is our wonderful guitarist who's been with us from the start. I think he's been at all but maybe one or two of these events. So Jeff, as always, thank you, my friend, for your beautiful music. Um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, I want to thank Subtext Bookstore. Uh, Sarah is out in the back from Subtext. Uh, they're an independent bookseller in St. Paul, uh, which have become a wonderful partner. Sarah, thank you very much. And you can purchase uh, Aaron's book back there, and Aaron is happy to inscribe these uh, afterwards as well. And then a final word of thank you. Um, over the years, and I've said this before, uh, the biggest question I get is, uh, where do you come up with the ideas? For the speakers, in some cases, there's not a good answer to that. In some cases, there's a very specific answer. Tonight is the latter category. Um, Amanda, where are you? Are you? Oh, she's over here. Uh, Amanda Berger, um, who is sitting over there, is on the staff of St. Philip Deacon. Amanda, actually, I, I've never tallied it. You might have the record for the most suggestions for awesome speakers, but it was Amanda's idea to bring Aaron, so will you please thank Amanda? <laughs> and I think you may notice I need a new prescription, by the way. <laughs> which is on the way. I can't wait. I'm so sick of doing this. Anyway, uh, okay, Aaron, I'm going to invite you back up. Uh, if there are questions, please come to one of the mics and uh, ask. We come down here. <laughs> no questions. I thought you guys were still mad about the Vikings thing. <laughs> Hi. So uh, my name is Amanda Berger. Um, I first encountered your book about a year ago, and so I've read it twice now and led book club about it. But one of the things that has come up in conversation with multiple people that have read it is you talk a little bit about how when we make changes in our lives, that sometimes that change becomes a new metric per for perfection. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Ah, oh, yes, I love that conversation. Um, I, think, I think making changes is so hard and it takes so much inertia that we, we get a little bit of pride when we do it well. Um, and suddenly we take that on as our new identity, right? So I know one example for me was <clears throat> um, after I reduced so much of my excess, there, there was this big campaign toward minimalism. And I identified so much with that. Yes, yes. That, oh, that's what I am. I'm a minimalist. And I began to take so much pride and so much identity in that. 
that then when I would um, say slip up and buy a steam cleaner off of Home Shopping Network, which actually <laughs> happened. I didn't need it. I took it back. Um, <laughs> When something like that would happen, you would beat yourself up, right? Because, because here you are preaching the gospel of minimalism or whatever, and you just bought a steam cleaner for seventy nine ninety nine that you don't even need. So um, I, think, I think for me, the trick uh, to not taking so much pride in those changes that we're making is just to not identify with that particular thing and, and to, to put our identity only in something that's unchanging. That's been a constant daily reminder for me, as in um, there is one thing that is unchanging that, that has ownership over my identity. Um, and everything else can just be that mix of, um, you know, we are a great many things and, every, and, that, and that needs to just be okay. And so us stop striving for, for, for perfection in that one area of life that's measurable um, and move towards something that is not. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. So I liked what you said about... Um, once you slow down, you, don't, you might not have to know the answers. Once you slow down, you have space to, to kind of figure things out. So I've heard, especially uh, thinking about retirement, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, you better figure out what you're going to do next. You're that type A person, and, you know, you're going to be really unhappy if you don't have it figured out before you take the next step. So it sounds like you're saying that um, maybe you just have to stop before you can figure it out. And... Or no? <laughs> no, that's a great that's a great question. And and then so then if you do that is uh, how long is it supposed to take you to? Uh, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> figure Amen. it out. Or or being a type A person is there a strategy one is supposed to employ? <laughs> I love that. How long is it supposed to take? You know, here's here's what's interesting. I wouldn't say. Um, I, I don't know that the best advice would be to, to just stop what you're doing. I, I think pausing to reflect um, on the why is always really important. Why am I choosing this? Why do I want to move on from it? Um, but, but I don't know either that, it, that we were just talking about this in the car. I think it's not as if God can't work in any scenario. And I think a lot of times we assume we have to have everything, our next steps planned out, um, and it has to look really um, tidy, and it has to make sense, and it has to be logical, and I, but I feel like even if we don't know what that next step is, there's a lot of beauty in staying also, um, and God can work in the going. He, you know, I, I just, I feel like a lot of times we believe there's one of our, we have to have one life passion and pursue that with everything. But, but what if instead we just strive to live a passionate life? We don't, we don't have to find that one thing. Um, we can bring passion into whatever that is. I knew a security guard named Eton. Um, he worked in the, um, the, what's the Hollywood Chinese theater? He worked in that building, um, which was across the street from my old office. And I would go see him, and he, every day he was whistling and cheering, and he was the happiest security guard ever. Um, and I, I chatted with him over lunch one day and um, asked, you know, did, so you always wanted to be a security guard, right? I can tell you're just so happy about it. And he said, no, I, I failed out of medical school. This is plan B. <laughs> um, and yet he brings so much passion and happiness to other people just doing what he absolutely you know, did, just not at all what was expected of him. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. So um, does that answer your question? Who knows how long it takes today? It takes, it, it takes it one day to be passionate where you are. I think it's very fitting that the uh, messenger came to us on the International Day of Women. And I find that what you were saying um, is in many ways quite the opposite of some of the messages that we hear, we were hearing today. But that's not my question. My question has to do with what you have been reading. You mentioned Frederick Beekner at one point 
in your talk, and I'm wondering what you have been reading in these last six years that has in any way informed your thinking. Okay, ask me one more time. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Is it informed by? What, what have you been reading what that, has, reading? Been, that oh. has informed your thinking? Oh, I'm such a reader. That's the best question. I can, I can talk about books all day. Uh, well, I mean, right now, I'm rereading The Phantom Tollbooth. Did anybody read that as a child? So good, so good. Um, and that's actually informed quite a bit um, of the, the lie that we, you know, we assume adults, we should have it figured out by now, but we're just kids, you know, we're just we're children. Um, I love memoirs. Um, so let's see, I read a lot of... Um, I read a lot of, of memoirs from women, primarily. Um, Beth Ann Fennelly is one. Uh, I read old Joan Didion work. Um, I have read um, recently, oh gosh, no, not a lot of fiction. Um, I love C.S. Lewis, um, Screwtape Letters. Um, I would say what has informed most of my perspective has just been, you know, anybody that's telling their story with honesty, um, anybody that's telling the truth that uh, perhaps we don't have it figured out. I love people that ask questions, um, that, that wrestle quite a bit with, with why, why this status quo is the way it is, I suppose. Um, let me think of... Um, I have to send you a list of more, but but I would say, any any memoir where somebody um, and I don't like the tidy ones either. I don't I don't I don't need the happy before and after story because I think we're all kind of living in the middle. So um, I will pick up any book where you're going to give it to me straight. Here's here's what I'm working with and here's what I'm trying to figure out. Six years ago, you stepped out of a box, a box that people had painted you into because that's who they knew who you were. When you stepped out of the box, friends you had, did they stay friends? Did you feel guilty about walking out of that box and doing something else? And how did you deal with the absence of who you were as to who you became? Oh gosh, that's good. Oh, that's you're deep. <laughs> <sighs> yes, that's good. You're bringing it hard. You're mad about the Vikings too. <laughs> I feel it. I feel it. Oh, um, did I feel guilty? Yes, yes, a hundred percent. Um, <sighs> you know. Hmm. I think, I think um, a lot of, of this kind of weaves into the identity question uh, where sometimes, I see this in my kids a lot. We tell our kids who they are uh, for them by accident. We don't mean to, but I think a lot of times our culture tells us who we are and we don't really stop to question that. We don't really stop to think, um, is that something I'm willing to identify with? Um, what happens when I no longer identify with, with it? Um, and I think, I think that's probably a life journey. For, for me, maybe it's my life's journey to, to shedding off those layers of what I've been told I am and, and realizing, you know, um, I mentioned it earlier, but we are a great many things is one of my favorite quotes. Um, because I find that, that, that when, when we can truly identify with a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different identities, and we can no longer say, yes, this is, what, this is who I am because this is what, I told, what I'm told by our culture, but instead, this is who I am and that I'm a child of God and how much that encompasses and how much, you know, we sing it to our children, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Sometimes all of the children of the world are within us. Sometimes that means we are a lot. Um, we are abundant beings. 
<clears throat> and, and that we're not just one thing and one identity. And, and so, so who we are is who we can become and, and vice versa. So I think to answer your question, yes, that there, there is guilt. Um, should, should that inform your next steps? Never make a decision out of fear. Never, I, I don't like to make decisions out of, out of fear or um, out of a spirit of timidity. I, I, don't, um, I don't believe that's what we're called to do. And so I, I would like to move forward otherwise. Does that answer your question a little bit? We can talk after. Not about the Vikings. Okay, so going once. Oh, we do. Oh, okay. Okay, now you're all going to come up. Great. <laughs> How have your conversations with your parents changed from childhood to this point about your faith journey? How have my conversations with my parents changed? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Oh, do you think particularly since as becoming a mother or no? Since you made these decisions, yeah. changing your life. You know, I'm always really careful to, um, I don't ever want to think, um, we are able to make the choices that we are because of the choices that our parents made and the choices that their parents made. And I think we have to look back at historically to even, um, we wouldn't have these choices. We're very privileged in that way. So, so I, don't, um, I don't fault uh, at all. My parents raised me in the most incredible fashion. Um, I think when I talk to my parents about the way we choose to live our life. I mean, we're, we're Midwesterners, so we're polite. <laughs> um, we're very polite. And so, um, you know, it, it comes up in conversation. We homeschool. My parents were both public education teachers. And um, I always try to, th to thank them for, um, for all the many perspectives they instilled in me. Um, I, I think there's room for gratitude in every conversation that we have even when it means it, that we're so different from each other. Um, there's so much room. Because I was raised in a family that valued education, I can pour my work into educating my kids. You know, it doesn't matter how that happens. It matters that it does. And so, um, so my, I guess the way that our conversations have changed in that... Um, I will, I will never see myself as that I'm on the same level as my parents. You know, I still do seek their advice and their counsel, and I do still see, I, I, want, I want their approval. Um, and I think, I think a part of me still seeks it, but still understands that um, at the end of the day, I, I, need, I need to... to take this path, um, and sometimes it's a little more lonely, and sometimes it doesn't really, they're, they're, it's, not, it's not necessarily cheerleaded, but, um, but I do think there's room for grace, and there's room for um, empathy in that as well. Um, it's, so it's, it's changed a bit, but I, I know they love me, and I love them, and I think there's a lot of um, respect. Okay, so th this will be our uh, last, last question. Last question. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's kind of a dual question too. So, um, the first one is if you're willing to share about your adoption journey, yeah. I'd be curious to hear because I was adopted myself, and our family might be looking into adoption. So, just if you're willing to share a little yeah. bit about, I'd be curious about that. And then the other one um, is I'm wondering how you. Um, what tools you use for um, having more faith over fear, like with your husband's thing, and you know, as things happen in life that you know can be really scary and fearful. How, what other tools besides writing do you use to cope? Faith over fear. On the, okay, wow. Well, um, well, the first one that is a long story. We will talk about that um, later. Come find me, but. It, um, Domestic adoption, um, 
for us, it happened very fast. Uh, it was a really, I, I, feel, I feel like maybe this actually answers both of your questions at the same time, because for me, it doesn't take much to choose faith over fear when you see God's provisions in the past. You know, I, I, I look back and um, the, the adoption of our son, it, it's difficult for me to talk about because my, oh, my love and my gratitude is wrapped up into the grief of another woman and, and my joy is wrapped up into, into her sorrow. And that's a really hard thing to, um, to reconcile for me. Um, but what a gift he is. Um, it, it, we were set up for a very long process, and then uh, we just received a call that there was a safe haven baby uh, a few hours north of us. And he was dropped off in a hospital, and the details aligned so perfectly with what our family was seeking and what what his mother was seeking, um, that it couldn't, it, it, it just, it had God's fingerprints all over it. And I know you hear that all the time. But for me, I've, I feel like I've been granted a lot of those big and small um, affirmations along the way of my life that, that, yeah, your path has been winding and it's had a lot of detours, but, um, but look at everything that I've done, right? And, and, and I'm big enough for you to have faith in. And I'm not saying that there are days where I'm fearless, because holy moly, like I just, I, I feel like, um, for me it doesn't come out in fear, it comes out more in anxiety, it comes out more in that low grade, like what if, and um, I, need, I need to find a way to control this situation. But, um, I think at the end of the day, it offers me so much peace when you do kind of give up um, and you release a little bit from all of those tiny things. Um, there's a quote in my book that says, I used to think the opposite of control is chaos, but the opposite of control is surrender. And so, you know, we tell ourselves that the world will fall apart if we're not doing and doing, doing, or if we're... Um, if we're offering our faith in something else, and, and it's not true. It's, um, we, can, we can choose to accept that there is a bigger plan um, with, with not necessarily us at the center of it, and um, I do find that that helps quite a bit. Um, I think with accepting, I, I think part two of having faith over, it's not necessarily having faith in lieu of fear. I think it's having faith alongside of fear. I think it's that um, faith is not the absence of fear and not the absence of doubts, but it's that, that you're choosing to believe. Like, I'm choosing to believe in your promises today, God. I'm still scared. I'm still scared. But, um, but I, I have faith and believe in you as well. Is that, is that okay? Okay, wonderful. I think Tim's good. Tim, you're coming up. I yeah. am, okay. yes. So, <clears throat> thank you all for coming tonight, um, <clears throat> and I'm going to give Aaron a little gift. I'm going to, if you'll permit me, I want to say one quick thing about this. We've been giving these out, uh, again, for 15 years. They're a small piece of granite, um, not blank, you know, that'd be weird. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> but it's got the Faith and Life logo. It says, um, well, I'll read what it says in a second, but I, I, re I reached out to a speaker who lives in the UK to ask him a question. He'd been with us 10, 12 years ago, and I said, hey, this is Tim. I'm from the Faith and Life series. I don't know if you remember me, but I've got a question. He wrote back, oh, I think about you every day because I use that granite thing as a hot pad. <laughs> Yay! So a little pro tip. <laughs> anyway, what it says is, with thanks to Aaron Lochner for bringing Faith to Life, we thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what a pleasure. Thank you.